Thank you so much for watching the latest AI Weekly update from Henry AI Labs up to the week of July 15th, 2021. A new change, now all the paper links and content covered in the video will now be hosted on a Notion page in the description of the video rather than a list of the description links. First up, we have a really exciting new development in AI from OpenAI and also GitHub Copilot titled Evaluating Large Language Models Trained on Code. What this is, is it's large GPT style transformers where it does the left to right autoregressive modeling, predicts the masked out token at the end of a sequence, scaled up from ranges to 300 million up to 12 billion parameters. This is trained on a data set of GitHub code, about 159 gigabytes of it. It's also fine tuned with programming problems and continuous integration tests. And we'll go through the details like how they use repeated sampling where you have these say like beam search or greedy search decodings of the uh, generation trees and so on, how you can uh, increase the temperature, sample many candidates, and then pass it through these unit tests. And the unit testing is a huge difference between, say, uh, code generation and then image or text generation because you have this ground truth correct, passes the test, doesn't pass the test, this kind of evaluation. So we'll go through the details presented in this paper. Also from OpenAI, we have a really exciting paper titled Multitask Curriculum Learning in a Complex Visual Hard Exploration Domain, Minecraft. This is exploring the utility of curriculum learning in Minecraft, where it plays this Simon Says task. So Simon Says is uh, giving it an item to achieve in the Minecraft world. It has to, uh, in the world of Minecraft, you have like a pickaxe and you mine at the dirt and you can uh, like craft items. So you, you have like this tech tree where you learn to explore the world and then craft these items. And Simon Says is uh, giving you the item that it wants you to go get and you get the reward for that. So there's a curriculum where uh, it's structuring which kind of reward you're given to achieve. And there's also this uh, exploration bonus that they describe in these different details for making this work and also this bi-directional uh, learning curve to help with catastrophic forgetting and so on and a really exciting experimental framework with Minecraft a uh, research from Jeff Kloon at OpenAI building on works like Poet, uh, Generative Teaching Networks, uh, Animal, this, these ideas of these AI generating algorithms which I think is one of the most exciting ideas in AI and deep learning research. Next up, we have an investigation on active learning and visual question answering titled Mind Your Outliers, Investigating the Negative Impact of Outliers on Active Learning for Visual Question Answering. So active learning is a strategy where we uh, wanna acquire some data to label. So we have some labeled data and then we have a massive pool of unlabeled data and we're gonna use active learning and uncertainty in the model's predictions and other ways of structuring this uncertainty generally is what we're talking about with active learning. And we're gonna use that uncertainty in the prediction, high entropy predictions, to guide which points we wanna label. So this is showing that there are these collective outliers that say uh, the problems are underspecified, like uh, it requires external knowledge to answer the question, like uh, what symbol does this describe when that's not contained in the data set, or uh, you know, other kind of things like multi-hop reasoning they describe. These different problems with the collective outliers that are selected by active learning with these visual question answering data sets. This data set map to visualize the confidence and confidence and uh, variability of the model's prediction throughout training. Other details on how to uh, fix active learning and make this work as a strategy for uh, acquiring labels and efficiently training these models. So also on this topic, we have prioritized training on points that are learnable, worth learning, and not yet learned. So again, we're looking at this paradigm where we have uh, different approaches for data selection. We have ideas like active learning where we're using uncertainty as the proxy for which uh, data points we should train on next. Also curriculum learning where we say we want to focus on the easy examples that are learnable first and then graduate to the harder examples. And then we have online batch selection where we deliberately select the high loss points in our data set to, uh, you know, to train on next. So differently from the previous paper, this is the setting where you have the label. So say you have uh, best, ex best described in say a self-supervised learning data set where you have this massive corpus of text and then you have the mass tokens and you're trying to select uh, say the sequences that you want to train on next so uh, this is exploring this new strategy for using a validation set a smaller proxy model in order to uh, use this online batch selection technique of high loss and they introduce this new uh, information about the validation labels that are gained by training on this training point in order to select for which point to train next Concluding this topic of the meta optimization of the optimization of the hyperparameters that govern deep learning, whether it's the active learning where we're selecting which points to learn from next or these miscellaneous high level controllers for these black box algorithms. So uh, say we're selecting different things like the learning rate, the uh, weight decay, batch size, data augmentation parameters, or say hyperparameters on curriculum learning, active learning, and so on. We have these algorithms like random search, grid search, Bayesian optimization, or evolutionary algorithms. You can also use reinforced learning and then differential search like say uh, the darts neural architecture search algorithm these are some strategies for hyperparameter optimization so we've had a really interesting algorithm titled uh, population-based training so population-based training 
It not only learns a static configuration of the hyperparameters, but it adjusts the schedule throughout training. So you have a population, they train for say 10 epochs, then you stop, evaluate the population, keep the top K percent, and then the remaining K percent are copied from the top K, and then you do some perturbation of the hyperparameters. So this uh, new algorithm, population-based training two, population-based banded optimization, is integrating a Bayesian optimization controller within the population-based framework. So when you copy the top K percent, and now you're selecting a new set of hyperparameters, you're now gonna guide that with a Bayesian optimization, op optimization algorithm, instead of just kind of like heuristically sampling from the uh, optimization, the hyperparameter pool. And they're gonna experiment this, comparing it with the original population-based training, as well as the asynchronous ASHA algorithm that they compare on uh, reinforced learning control tasks in the online and offline setting. Next up, we have new research advancing our understanding of prompting. Cutting down on prompts and parameters, simple few shot learning with language models. So prompts are these ideas where say in GPT-3, we have the in-context learning prompts where we give demonstrations of the task as a part of the input for downstream tasks. So it does few shot learning by learning from these prompts in order to uh, you know, transfer to some downstream task. So another idea in pattern exploiting training is to use these patterns or these prompts in order to guide the uh, task difference from language modeling into say some classification tasks. So you have a verbalizer that maps from say uh, great into positive if you're say doing movie reviews or something like that. So it's this mapping from the language modeling dictionary into the downstream class labels. So they're comparing these two different approaches of whether you want to have some automated tuning for some massive prompt, some optimized prompt, and then you don't actually uh, fine tune the parameters of the pre-trained network that could be something massive like GPT-3 and so on. So you do some kind of automated search. This could be manual design. It could be discrete search where you're you know, looking for tokens, or it could be a continuous optimization thing where you have gradients flow back through the continuous embeddings of the prompt and so on. And they're comparing this with this prompt-based fine tuning where you use a prompt in order to fine tune the model. So there are no, no prompts are showing that the verbalizer thing is really useful. They show that no prompting as well as these uh, adaptation layers like adapter, bit fit, can really help with the efficiency of transfer learning. And overall, this looks to be a huge advancement in the efficiency of transfer learning and natural language processing. Also on the topic of prompting, we have a very surprising paper titled Multimodal Few Shot Learning with Frozen Language Models. So similar to past papers that are exploring ideas like uh, pre-trained transformers as universal computation engines, they're showing that you can take images, embed them into the language modeling uh, embedding space by using a vision encoder, and then you can perform a uh, few shot and zero shot inference where you have images as well as languages. So these are known as these vision language multimodal tasks where you say take in uh, this picture, uh, you know, the pictures and text, and then you use that to make inferences whether the completion task is say visual question answering or, you know, entailment, whatever t task you design, combining the vision and uh, language with visual question answering being one of the most common things uh, tested in this paper. So multimodal few shot learning with frozen language models is showing that this phenomenon of prompting models, uh, prompting these pre-trained models with some additional context in the input also works for these multimodal vision language tasks. So also in the scope of multimodal learning, where we're trying to improve, say, language models with visual supervision, this paper is building on the research of vulcanization. Vulcanization is using visual tokens to align with the language tokens in mass language modeling. So say you mask out bread, and then you have a, a, an image of bread, and you're kind of aligning this in the pre-training, so you have these visual tokens that correspond with the language tokens and overall help with the supervision and this idea of visual grounding for these language models. So this latest paper, VidLang KD, Improving Language Understanding via Video Distilled Knowledge Transfer, is using this cross-modal pre-training where you have the video text pairs, and then you're distilling that knowledge through the text part into a text-only model. So it's a way of having this uh, efficiency where you don't want to have this cross-modal model, cross -modal model <laughs> for uh, these downstream tasks, like text-only tasks. So you wanna have some way of transferring this uh, representation and they use the interface of knowledge distillation to do this. Next up, we'll look at a blog post from Facebook AI describing advances in audiovisual self-supervised learning. This is where you use uh, video data to align the visual representations as well as the audio from the data. They present these two new algorithms that uh, look at ways to overcome this problem of having uh, negative, uh, bad negatives as well as faulty positives extending the scope to include more positives and uh, having more structure in the contrastive learning objective and so on that we'll get into more as we go later in the video. Next up we have SCARF, self-supervised contrastive learning using random feature corruption. And I really like this paper because it's bringing these advances of self-supervised learning into tabular data. So it has this uh, technique for how you're gonna be sampling the, uh, the uh, features to blur out and so on and how you're constructing this positive pair alignment with uh, tabular data and using similar kind of frameworks to say SimCLR, MoCo, or some SIAM in order to uh, train these representations and have some kind of self-supervised pre-training 
with tabular data. Researchers from the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence, amongst other institutions, are working really hard on this project of semantic scholar and these scientific literature mining applications. We have things like CORE19, which is a data set of all papers related to COVID-19. We have things like CASPER, uh, TLDR. There's a long list of papers from uh, the Allen Institute and others that are building on this application of scientific literature mining. We're trying to take these natural language processing models and train them on data sets of scientific papers. Papers like BioBert, CyBert, and so on are showing the results of, say, doing language model fine tuning on these scientific paper data sets. Multi site modeling realistic citations requires moving beyond the single sentence, single label setting, is looking at this uh, subtask of scientific literature mining of citation analysis. So, say you're uh, going through a scientific paper and you see a citation and you want to classify the intent of the citation. So, citations provide a lot of background in these papers. So, say, when you read this paper, it'll you know, cite these other papers from scientific literature mining. Citations provide a lot of context and it's a really good uh, task for supervised learning, for understanding the behavior of these models trained on scientific paper data sets. So this is a new advancement on extending the scope from say single uh, sentence classification to longer uh, context, context lengths, as well as multi-labels. And this is a illustration of their annotation interface for how they uh, employ uh, students to label these data sets in a really interesting uh, study and new data set. One of the most exciting applications of language models is to use them for uh, knowledge bases or closed book question answering systems. So we want to be able to ask questions to these language models and some of these different kinds of knowledge tests have these different characteristics. Particularly this paper, Time Aware Language Models as Temporal Knowledge Bases are exploring the behavior of language models answering factual questions that depend on time. So say you ask it uh, who is the president and it's been trained on data from say 2000 to 2018 where there's a change in presidents and so on. So it needs to have this meta information about time in order to better answer these questions. So this paper is using this prefix in the T5 style unification of text to text tasks in order to better account for uh, time sensitive questions. One of the most interesting topics in deep learning and neural architecture design are these long range transformers. These are transformers that can attend over an input sequence of longer than 512 tokens. So say it could take in a high resolution input without needing to break it up into patches, or it could take an entire scientific paper and so on instead of needing to chunk it into 512 tokens. So this paper, Long Short Transformer, Efficient Transformers for Language and Vision, is uh, combining two different ideas, the strided almost convolution style attention where you have these local windows that you apply attention on as well as these low rank projection ideas. So a low rank projection, say singular value decomposition, you decompose the query uh, key, I'm not, I'm not sure, I think it's the key value, but you decompose two of those matrices into the low rank approximations and then multiply those by each other rather than doing the full n squared uh, matrix multiplication. So, so they're going to use a parameterization to have a dynamic projection that approximates the low rank projection thing. And they're going to use a novel normalization layer that combines the outputs from the strided attention with the low rank approximation and overall advance the state of long range transformers. So also in the scope of neural architectures, we have an interesting new design for ensemble learning. Ensemble learning is where we have uh, many different models and we're aggregating their prediction through something like say just naive voting of each of the models in order to aggregate one prediction for the given input. So they have this delegator model and they design uh, this loss functions for how the delegator model is going to choose between the experts. Say you have a soft attention over these different expert models and these kind of interesting ideas for uh, building on uh, ensemble learning with these attention layers and also has this early exit where it will make some prediction already and if that has high enough confidence you just won't, you won't even bother with the ensemble learning and just output that thing. And so they describe these different losses. They use things like optimal transport in order to have this uh, balance with the expert assignment in training and so on. An interesting idea that achieves you know this 80% top one accuracy with these really efficient models. So it's interesting to see that uh, this ensemble learning strategy is improving in efficiency even though it kind of seems like the opposite idea of ensemble learning. It seems to me more like a use all the resources you can kind of idea but they're showing that it can improve efficiency through these different uh, loss functions. Next up we have Basalt, a benchmark for learning from human feedback. And I think this is one of the more interesting things in the weekly update this week. This is a, a Minecraft benchmark for combining different ways of providing reward signal to reinforce learning agents. So in addition to having a reward function, you also might do things like imitation learning where you, you know, grab the controller and show the model how to do it and to record the actions that you're taking given the visual uh, observations of the states. And maybe it's conditioned on the goal as well, something like that. Uh, comparisons where you show it comparisons of say two agents behavior and so on different ways of structuring reward signals to these agents and you imagine Minecraft uh, particularly they give the example of build a waterfall it would be hard to specify build a waterfall with just a scalar reward function maybe you have some kind of uh, observation state is trying to get to or trying to see something exactly 
and all these kinds of ideas. So this is a new benchmark. I think it's going to be a NURBS 2021 uh, competition where you're trying to have all the, integrate these diverse ways of providing reward signal to these learning agents. Then we have an article describing the one year anniversary of Luther AI, the creators of GBT Neo, as well as the other, these other projects that they describe in the blog post. Uh, it's a really interesting blog post about how they've organized over a uh, Discord server, uh, how they got access to the compute to build GPT Neo, and these different things like how they, uh, you know, got Mesh TensorFlow to work, and then scaling it to the, and then transferring it to a Jax code base. All these ideas of, uh, you know, how they've organized this Eleuther AI team overall thing that this open source deep learning that I think is really interesting. And again, they're the creators of GPT Neo, which is one of the most useful language models. And a demo is available if you want to test this out. So then we have a really interesting announcement about toward continual learning systems, kind of in the space of ML ops, building these systems around the training of deep neural net training and maintenance of deep uh, neural networks of these deep learning systems. Towards continual learning is about uh, building models that when they're deployed, they continue to learn from the data compared to say, uh, being trained on a stale slice of the data and then the model's not updated. And then as it starts to see these real world distribution shifts, the model breaks down. So these are some ideas uh, towards building a system that helps with continual learning and helps with overall the evaluation suite, I think is the tool that's proposed in this article for how you are going to probe for how the real world distribution shift is uh, you know, corrupting the model and how the additional data is helping. So that concludes a quick preview of the next AI Weekly Update uh, video on Henry AI Labs. Following will be a deeper dive into each of these uh, different papers. So differently from previous uh, Weekly Update videos, is gonna be uh, slide style and it'll take longer for these videos to roll out. So starting with evaluating large language models trained on code, you know, going through all of these different papers, I'm going to be making uh, slide presentations of them. So it's going to be different than just going through the paper. And this will roll out from, say, uh, today, Thursday, maybe all the way into Saturday or Sunday. And then it'll all be compiled together into one long video. So uh, following this will be the deeper dive explaining each of these uh, videos further. And if you're interested, the links to each of these papers are organized in a Notion page in the description of the video. Mm -hmm.